LinkedIn News. From the news team at LinkedIn, I'm Jesse Hempel, and this is Hello Monday. It's the third week of our summer series, Navigating the New Office. And just as we've done for all of the episodes in this series, I'm bringing on a co-host. It's our producer, Sarah Storm. Hey, Sarah. Hey, Jesse. So, Sarah, we're at the halfway point here with the series. Already? Yeah, already. Wow. And the trend we're tackling this week, well, it's that people are just interested in working less. Hello Monday is recorded and produced in the United States, where a lot of people have to work more than 40 hours, and a lot of people have to work more than one job. But the pandemic caused many people to consider what's important to them. And where they could, they prioritized working less. And companies got into it here as well. They were trying really hard to avoid burnout, which has become such a huge problem. And so they introduced four-day work weeks or frequent days off. It turns out that working less is not an American phenomenon. Not at all. On today's show, we have Gregory Warner, host of NPR's Rough Translation. Now, the show looks at work culture in other countries, and I have to say I really love it, Sarah. We are going to talk about three of his episodes today. One about an American woman in France who could not believe that she was really supposed to take this very long lunch hour every day. (laughs) That's so American. I want my lunch to be shorter. (laughs) Gregory's also going to tell us about this law in Portugal that makes it illegal for your boss to contact you after work. And finally, we'll learn a little bit about slacker culture in China. Here's Gregory. So we got a a listener who wrote us actually while she's an American woman who's an English teacher at the University of Strasbourg named Caitlin. And she she called us actually, she, she recorded this voicemail while she was at her desk eating a salad, essentially breaking the law. Because in France, it is forbidden to eat lunch at your work site. And that has been true for over a hundred years. It's this very old law. And we were just so struck by the fact that A, um, she's this American woman. She didn't want to go out for a, a long leisurely lunch break. She wanted to get her to-do list done, but she felt like a criminal doing it. And she was in France for the long haul. So she had a French husband and she wanted to live in France, but she wanted to figure out some way in which to be a productive American and not essentially break, break the law in France. What I got from her story was something that really resonated for me, which is that that Mm -hmm. feeling that most people that I know have, that um, your to-do list is expanding and never ending. And uh, no matter what your time looks like, if you have an hour and a half long chunk in the middle of the day, it would make sense to you that you'd want to try to tackle some of it. And the lack of doing it would create a sort of uh, an anxiety, at least among the people that I know in America. Yeah. And she, you know, she had been dealing with this really since uh, since she'd moved to France and started working in France. Um, At at her first job, she says her, her boss would tell her, I don't think you're appreciating the full length of time that you're supposed to be taking for lunch, which we laughed about because it was so different (laughs) from not only as, as you point out the way bosses might talk to us in America, but the voice in our head which tells us, hey, we need to get lunch over with quickly to get back to all the things we need to do. What, what we explore in that episode, though, is, is, that, is that calculus actually accurate? What's interesting to me about that, right? Um, there are plenty of things in employment codes here in the U.S. and I'm sure in France, too, that go underobserved and are never called out. Um, what you're saying also, or what Caitlin is saying, is that this is mm-hmm. a cultural norm and that if you do something different than that cultural norm, your peers will call you out on it. So it's it's substantial. It is, in effect, in culture, the way things work. Oh, yeah. And there are all kinds of parallel codes that have emerged from this one code, which is that you don't talk about work at lunch. So Caitlin actually talks about this. She says, well, she tries to go out with her colleagues, and then she tries to mention some piece of work that they're both working on and they say, well, no, 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 you're not really supposed to talk about that. Let's talk about our vacations and the movies we saw and, uh, you know, our families. Right. Uh, so that's enforced. That's not in the law, but that's a social code. Um, so what's the impact of this, according to Caitlin? 
Well, for <laughs> I mean, for Caitlin, it's just a source of enormous stress because um, she doesn't want to be the pariah at her company. Um, she wants to get to know her colleagues. She loves her colleagues, but she doesn't have time to spend in the middle of the day. Um, what we structure the episode, essentially we go to all these experts and we find all this scientific data to, to support taking a lunch outside of work and to support the idea of not speaking about work at lunch. And then we try to convince Caitlin um, to, <laughs> to do this. But I have to say, like, for me, um, presenting her with all these French arguments, I sort of felt like I was arguing with myself because every time Caitlin would knock down one of the one of the uh, arguments for having the French lunch, I, I kind of agreed with her. Yeah. Uh, so I was also trying to convince myself to, to, you know, to take more of a break. Well, when it came to the arguments for the kinds of things yeah. that, and by the way, our listeners are going to have to listen to the full episode to get the whole shebang, and you should. I appreciate that. But, you know, the, the kinds of things that are being put forth, they made a lot of sense to me. Like the whole idea that you actually had a lot less conflict, like work-oriented conflict with people who you knew deeply across different planes. Oh, I, I love this idea. The idea that um, when you're not talking about work at work and, and French workspaces, as I understand, can be very formal. Uh, when you're forced to not talk about work, you have to find out about each other. We ended up sending a reporter to various French bistros to ask them about their theory of lunch, <laughs> which they found very odd. <laughs> but what they told us was, you know, when you, when you talk to somebody not about the mutual project that you're both trying to get done, but about their life, you realize, oh, that's what's going on. Yeah. That's why they're not as present um, this week as they were last week. What's so different about the French model, and I'm not, I'm not really not saying that the French model is better or worse. I just think it gives us perspective on right. ourselves. Um, what's different is that it is a completely collective exercise. Meaning Caitlin does not have to, Caitlin, the American listener who wrote us, Caitlin does not have to, if she does go out to lunch, decide to schedule a lunch in, you know, a half hour block or a, an hour long block with a colleague to get to know them. She doesn't have to think, oh, is that person too busy? Will I be putting a burden on them? Um, she doesn't have to vow to take more rest time or, or, you know, to do more of that in her life. She just goes out for lunch. It is built into the day. It's completely easy. I almost think of it as a, almost like a public health model versus individual health. It's like the infrastructure is there. You don't have to worry. You don't have to think about it. Yeah. Um, so that, yeah, that's, that's really what I took away from the, the French reporting. Well, the other thing I just want to point out about Caitlin, and then we'll, uh, we'll move on to our next story, is that, um, Caitlin didn't want to not have lunch with her colleagues. She wanted to have her cake and eat it too. It seemed <laughs> right. to be like her position was just like, lunch is too long. I got other things to do. Let me take half of this time and spend it with my colleagues and half of this time I'm working through my to-do list. <laughs> yeah, no, I, we didn't. I mean, I don't want to give away the end of the story. We did not end up convincing Caitlin to take the, to fully subscribe to the French lunch custom. But I think what, what ended up happening was she realized, she realized that she'd much prefer to live in a country with a custom of a shared lunch. And she said that if she were to go back to an American work environment, she would feel very frustrated that that, that river of time was not available to, to dip her toe into, that she, she could not just enter into that flow. Um, the irony of that, of course, is that it, that only exists, that shared lunch only exists if lots of people decide or lots of people agree to take part in it. So the fact that France is this place where, yeah, 12 o'clock, you can get up from your desk and nobody will say anything. You will walk right to the bistro. You'll see all your friends. You'll have kind of a bunch of conversations. And then an hour and a half or possibly two hours later, you'll come back to work. Um, doesn't take any extra thought. Yeah. Of course, there's a lot more to it than that. And uh, <laughs> I hope our listeners will check it out. But um, I want to move on to Portugal, where you learn something very different about productivity and the yeah. culture around productivity versus the laws around productivity. Um, how did that episode come to be? Well, that episode came, came to be because we heard about this law in Portugal, which now makes it illegal for bosses to contact their employees after work. I'm just going to say that's a fantastic new law because <laughs> I am just the host listening to the story and I'm like, okay, go Portugal. Well, it's either a fantastic or it's a fantasy. And that's kind of what we explore. A, an employer will be fined up to $10,000 for 
email or for a text or for a call after working hours. And so this got a lot of coverage. People were very interested in this law. Uh, this was just passed at the end of 2021. And so, you know, six, seven months later, we were wondering, okay, how's it going? I mean, one of the things on Rough Translation, I should say, is, is that we're always working with local storytellers who are based in the place. Right. So Caterina Fernandez Martins is a Portuguese uh, reporter, and she ended up picking up this story and, uh, and, and reporting it. Well, I should say the announcement coincided with Web Summit, and Web Summit was a place that I went um, frequently. I did not yeah. usually visit with Portuguese entrepreneurs there. I usually visited mm. with American entrepreneurs there or similarly other people from around the world. And it was definitely understood that part of the job of Web Summit was to bring all of these people to Portugal to entice and invite them um, to to spend more time there. Um, so it, it wasn't lost on me that this law was announced around that time. In fact, I think at the summit on your show or at least spoke, spoke about it at the summit. Oh yes, no, absolutely. This was this was a very open invitation and advertisement to remote workers and digital nomads. And we should say it's working. I mean that that appeal is totally working. I mean I think uh, upwards of like eleven thousand Americans have moved there just in the past two years. A hundred thousand, almost a hundred thousand uh, Brits in the last two years. Gregory, and I have a writing see- coach who just moved there, and so now we have to uh, off time my our our sessions. Because she was like, Portugal is the place to be. So much better than yeah, America. Yeah, and be careful with uh, emailing her on a Saturday or Sunday. Yeah, I know, right? You might get it. You might get fine. <laughs> well, so that might be true for people coming in from abroad. But it seems like maybe the reality might be very different for people living in Portugal, going to their day jobs. Well, yes. And so that's why I, you know, I say the fine with a smile, uh, a rueful smile. Because, uh, in fact, as we uncover... This law is not being enforced, and it uh, it really is on paper this law, but for reasons that go deep into Portuguese history. And it, I thought what was so interesting about reporting the story was it made me think about where workplace cultures come from, like, and how do they persist? And without, I mean, we could we could talk more about the ending of the story, but but what we what we realize is that that relationship between bosses and employees has been was rooted really in in a kind of deviously designed dictatorship that um, that saw work as a way to control its citizens and to enforce loyalty and those patterns of uh, of behavior and expectations at work combined with economic crisis and all kinds of other forces which have made young people in Portugal have very few choices, um, have resulted in this toxic work culture that is that one law or 10 laws have not been able to, have not been able to change. So the dictatorship has fallen, but the right. culture that it engendered is something that we can't help but continue to pass along. And that right. lives within us and dictates how we treat each other regardless of the laws. Right. And when we went into this, I thought, okay, maybe this is like a, a generation story. Like maybe the bosses are of the age that they're close enough to the dictatorship that they were at least raised by people in that fascist dictatorship regime. And maybe they kind of bring that culture. Maybe the young the young employees are subjected to that. But what we found was something sort of more sinister, which is that both generations carry with them the trauma of that of that dictatorship and um, sort of the, the expectations of what's, I mean, I think that what we're expected to do at work and how we're supposed to be gets programmed into us very young and um, can be triggered in this way that, yeah, in, in Portugal feels especially, um, especially sinister, especially um, manipulative, I'll, I'll say. We're going to take a quick break here. When we come back, more with Gregory Warner, host of NPR's Rough Translation. And we're back. Gregory has one more story to share with us today. It takes place in China. The cultural emphasis of work there is that it should take up as many hours of your awake time as possible. There's a shorthand for this that you might have heard of before, 996. 
Hustlers work nine to nine, six days a week. That's 72 hours a week. And it might cause you to fall asleep on the subway or take naps in public. Sleeping in public is a badge of honor because China has a culture that promotes work, which is why this next story is so interesting. So this was pitched by our, our Beijing correspondent, Emily Fang. She, she got really interested in this um, particular guy who was a scooter thief. And in 2012, so scooters, electric scooters are huge in China. And, and of course, where they're scooters, I guess they're scooter thieves. This guy um, was arrested in uh, some years ago and he was filmed by the local, by a local um, TV news camera group, uh, sorry, a local TV news crew who said, uh, why do you not have a job? They actually asked him this on, on camera and he said, working is impossible for me. I cannot work. And that phrase became an incredible sensation in China. It went so viral. And this guy who, I won't say he looks like Che Guevara, but he does have some of the same kind of dark, uh, brooding good looks. Um, he became known as Tse Guevara. Tse being the, uh, the Mandarin word for to steal. And so he became this icon, this slacker icon, essentially. And people would... Uh, quit their jobs in his name or talk about how to quit their job. They created all kinds of memes, slacker-based memes. And so that's why he came under the attention of the Chinese authorities. And what um, our reporter was interested in was what would happen when he got out of prison. Right. Um, and so we followed his, his journey. Um, I just want to stick with this idea of what it might have meant to announce yourself publicly as someone mm. who didn't value work in a culture and in particularly the Chinese culture um, right. within the last few years. I mean, you're, you're asking for government involvement in doing that, no? Yeah, no, absolutely. Because what you're doing is you're violating these two important, um, two important kind of uh, codes. And one is, one is a, one is a national one. I mean, you're supposed to work uh, in order to, as your patriotic duty, you're supposed to help build China. We talked about that. But then you're also uh, supposed to support family. And you have to understand that with the one-child policy, many young Chinese are the, only, on the, are the only providers for their parents, their grandparents. And their lives are so different than, and their opportunities are so different than their parents could have, could have imagined for themselves. It's like, in some sense, it's kind of the opposite of the U.S. story in the sense that young people, at least on paper, have so many more opportunities than, than their parents. Gregory, I'm just going to stop you to say that um, yeah. even though I have lived a while in the world and written about China, when you first said um, you have an obligation to support your family, I immediately just jumped to thinking about raising that child when what you were talking about is thinking about that child supporting their parents. No, thanks for that clarification. And it kind of goes both ways because if you're the only child, ev all the hopes and dreams have been put on you. Right. Um, again, this was reported by Emily Fang. I'm just, I'm really just uh, bringing her reporting. But one of the things that she talks about is the overwhelming amount of income that is spent by Chinese parents on their child's education. So you basically invest everything in that in your kid and then what your kid just comes and says i don't like my job now i want to quit explore myself i mean that is that is very uh that is very difficult to do and and you're not only you're not only quitting your job you're you're giving up your responsibility to your family yeah right and um without giving away of course the entire story um how do things go for the scooter thief who is publicly talking about being a slacker and becomes an internet star overnight. Yeah, so the scooter thief, um, he ends up uh, curiously opening a barbecue restaurant, which we, uh, which Emily, our reporter, ended up visiting with her uh, producer, Owen. And um, the her experience there is gets very dramatic very quickly. It seems that he's living uh, the slacker dream. He is the boss of his own place. He can come and go as he pleases. He has this very uh, fun barbecue restaurant. But um, the 
first day she's there and then the second day she's there, she realizes there are forces that are controlling what he says and who he can talk to. I'd love for you to just think for a second with me about where that idea of slacker culture may have even come from. Is this something that found its roots in the West and worked its way over? No, it's, you know, it's interesting. Um, We didn't use this in the piece, but end up we end up profiling this one this high school teacher named named Aris who uh, we follow on this very quiet but but apparently very dramatic journey of figuring out whether she can quit her job and what it'll take to do that um, and for her you know the inspiration is actually the ancient Chinese um, poets who were hermits and for you know an anti-materialist and um this idea of saying no to the world and no to ambition for her is, is very, very Chinese. It has nothing to do with Western influence. You use the word ambition, and I think so much about productivity. And I'm wondering, in all the work that you do, just to step back a minute and think with me, what do you see as the connection between how people think about productivity and how people think about ambition? I feel like in a lot of places in the world, ambition and productivity are not aligned. Meaning it doesn't matter how productive you are or how work, how hard you work, you're not going to get ahead, you know, unless you have certain other things like um, it's a more nepotistic society or you need to have influence or you need to have gone to exactly the right school um, or you need to be part of a certain sort of class or, or um, ethnic group. And um, there, I think the flip side of that, though, is that there can be a kind of um, mistake that we make in, in the, the U.S. and other Western countries to think that productivity and um, that in, and ambition are so perfectly aligned as promised. I love that. Uh, you're very thoughtful on that, as I would cool. expect you to be as someone who swims in so many <laughs> different cultural waters. You know, these are just three of the stories on your show. And I'm I'm not just saying this because we're on the air. I, I love your show. I think your show is just a delight. Oh, thanks. And it is also a gift to listen to the kind of resourced reporting that goes into your show. I know the resources that takes. Mm-hmm. Um, if you could step back, what have yeah. you learned through doing the show about how work works in other places? I feel like reporting on this series has helped me realize that you know, we all want to improve ourselves. I mean, we, we're, we're told, okay, be more productive, uh, be smarter, work faster, work smart, you know, work, um, uh, do this and this to, 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 to work better. Um, but it, you know, that's, that's looking at things through a very individualist lens. It's looking at this idea that I can change myself. And what you realize is that, especially when it comes to work, um, so much of it is outside our control. Like we can say, um, oh, I want to rest more, but we're still going to get those emails in, and we still have that expectation that we're going to answer them. We have to contend with that. Now there are strategies that we can, we can, um, we can figure out. Uh, but, but I think that one of the things we, we try to do on Rough Translation is go to places where th- where the rules of the of rules of the road basically are really different, and we're going to get perspective on the things that we don't see. Like we're in conversation with ourselves. Sorry, that there are forces we're in conversation with that uh, have nothing to do with whether we're um, deciding to be a better person, and have to do with our past or our um, uh, our family or what the what the government wants or doesn't want from us. Um, and in some way, I feel like even if we're talking about a place that's far from listeners experience, just the experience, just the act of getting that perspective of seeing what we're talking about, what we're really talking about when we talk about work and changing work culture and changing our work self, um, can be liberating. That was Gregory Warner, the host of NPR's Rough Translation. You can hear all these episodes we talk about by searching for Rough Translation wherever you listen. I hope you do. And now I'm bringing back Sarah, as we've done for all of our special series episodes, to talk about what we just learned. Hey, Sarah, what did you think of that interview? 
I loved listening to you and Gregory talk. I also, I loved every single story, but I think about that French lunch hour. And as much as I love my job, and we know I love my job, it it sounds luxurious. And I was so curious that this, like, culturally, the whole, like, that's a place that France got to. What was most interesting to me about that particular French lunch hour was how when you are forced to spend that time every day with a group of people talking about not work, whether you like them or not, you build up a deeper relationship with them that allows you to trust them in a different way, I would think, and would maybe be more useful than a lot of the trust exercises we talk about in other episodes of the show, right? Organic rather than manufactured. Just an idea. (laughs) But listen, Sarah, here is the reason why I really wanted to have those three stories about how people are thinking about when and how to work in three other cultures. Because when you do that, then it becomes easier to like take a step back into American business culture and think, well, what around me is prescribed through culture rather than something I'm actually choosing into, right? Yeah. Yeah. I feel like we have to acknowledge that it's an uneven split how it plays out in the United States, right? There are a lot of people, as we said at the top of the episode, who have got to work hourly, who have got to do at least 40 hours or multiple jobs and way more than that, who are maybe like more akin to what's happening in China. And then for a lot of us, especially I think knowledge workers, we're at this point where that push to reevaluate what really matters to us is huge and it's happening all over. Yeah. Yeah. That's entirely right. And and of course, as inflation ticks up and the demands on our pocketbook are so much more intensely felt, like there, they, we should just say that there are a lot of people who feel they must work more than ever. But it's not just people who are making this decision. For knowledge workers in particular, working at companies like, heck, like the company that we work at, work at LinkedIn, um, those companies are trying to figure out what to do to keep people motivated. And as we go to hybrid workforces, to keep people like feeling their best on the job. And one of the things that they have come up with to avoid burnout is four-day work weeks, or in the case of LinkedIn, half days in the summer. We have a bunch of- Half days on Friday. Friday half days. We have a bunch of Fridays, eight Fridays in a row this summer, where we are invited, as long as we've finished our work, to leave. And that, I think, is an important thing, along with the four-day work week. The way that companies are implementing this, I think, impacts the conversation, Yeah. right? Are you expected to cram 40 hours into four days or- Uh, four and a half days? Or is it that you're meant to do the most you can do in the time you have allotted? It's the the golden question, right? Mm -hmm. And the answer to that question comes back to culture. So often we have such a deep commitment to productivity culturally in the United States. It's hard to step out of that. That is really why I think Gregory's show is as cool as it is, why I wanted to feature it. Because by looking at the culture of work in other countries, we can discern important things that help us make autonomous choices, choices for ourselves about how we're going to approach our work lives here in the U.S. I love that. And I will say, I think that the conversations that that people are having on the ground are actually, in some cases, really being paid attention to. And it feels like we, like the collective we of the workforce, maybe have this opportunity to impact where things go next. And that is very exciting and a little bit hopeful. It's where work is now. Yeah. So if you want to talk more about this with us, with me and Sarah, join us on Wednesday afternoon at 3 p.m. Eastern for our actual office hours, where we'll pick up this conversation with all of you who join. You can find us on the LinkedIn news page. And as always, if you like the show, please follow and review it wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you. And now I'm going to turn it over to Sarah for the credits. All right. Hello Monday is a production of LinkedIn. I produce this show with mixing by Joe DeGiorgi. Florencia Iriondo is head of original audio and video. Dave Pond is our head of news production. Michaela Greer and Victoria Taylor never slack us after hours. Our music was composed just for us by the mysterious Breakmaster Cylinder. Dan Roth is the editor-in-chief of LinkedIn. I'm Jesse Hempel. We'll be back next Monday with episode four of our special summer series, Navigating the New Office. Thanks for listening. It's it's not so much a room as a cubby that's created essentially by these two baffles that I built during the pandemic. But uh, this is fabric from Nairobi and uh, there's insulation in here and there's two by fours. 
And so, yeah, so our engineer, right, right before the, uh, or during the pandemic, he just instructed me how to build them. And uh, they work really well. Like I, I've been a foreign correspondent for quite a while. And uh, I just didn't know that, um, yeah, big, big, big amount of insulation behind you. And then in front of me, I have a little bit of acoustic foam um, would, would do so well. Like it's, it's not an NPR studio at all, but. Gets you pretty close. 